Okay. So what it does is it retains only ro those rows in X that have a match in Y. So only those rows in flights which have a match in top desk are retained. Okay. Now there's a very subtle difference between semi-join and between the second solution that I suggested, which is here. Okay, that is uh, uh, inner join desk. Right? So when you did an inner join, you will see that the result contained the columns from top desk also. Right? So when I did an inner join, my result was 141,145 times 20. Okay? So it had 20 columns because from inner join, there was a count and that also came in. Whereas when you do a semi-join, you see that the result contains only 19 columns here. That's a big difference because in, in inner join, the columns from the second table also enter into the results. Well, a semi-join is used purely for filtering alone. So it only filters the first table. The second table doesn't provide any new columns to the result. That's a big difference between the two things. Okay, so again, you understand how the join works. It's a semi-join, uh, but what we are saying is, uh, notice the, the line here, the solid line is only going up here. It found the matches, but it's only keeping these, right? They're, it's not adding on this part of it. So that's why it's called as a semi-join. The second table is used only for the purpose of determining what to retain, what not to retain. It doesn't contribute any new columns to the result. Okay, so only the existence matters, the specific rows actually don't matter at all. Anti-join is the exact opposite of semi-join. In semi-join, we are saying retain everything where there is a match. In anti-join, we are saying uh, retain only those for which there is no match or drop everything for which there is a match. Okay, so there is a match for these two, so drop them. Keep only this X31. Okay, so these two things are also sometimes uh, pretty useful when you're doing all kinds of operations. Uh, just finding that there's a match and all that is useful. Okay, so for example, if you want to find flights of planes which are not in the planes table, that is, uh, remember, you've got your flights table and in the flights table, there's a tail number to indicate which plane was used in that particular flight. Okay, and then there's a planes table indicating a complete list of all the planes. Now one would expect that all the flights in the flights table use planes which existed in the planes table. That's what we would expect. Okay, but let's see if that is actually true. I'm trying to find flights of planes which are not in the planes table. So you can do flights anti-join planes by tail num. Right, in other words, what we're saying is in the flights table, find all those rows whose tail num doesn't actually exist even in the planes table. Okay, and then uh, we are just counting how many times this is happening, right? For for each tail num, that is first here we have found all the uh, all the tail nums which don't even exist in the planes table. Now we are finding out for each of those tail nums how many flights occurred. So we are counting. Okay, so you'll see when you do this, uh, you'll actually see that there are quite a few planes, uh, quite a few flights for which the planes actually don't even exist in the planes table. Okay, so the question is, what does it mean for a flight to have a missing tail num? Right? Why do the tail num, uh, the tail numbers that don't have a matching record, what do they have in common? Okay, so if you do this, you I'm just saying x is uh, this this thing, right? That is uh, creating all the flights for which there is no tail num, right? If you run this, then it looks like there is a carrier called MQ, Envoy Air, which has uh, uh, most of the, quite a few of the results. So for example, I'm going here, uh, here, X is flights, anti-join. So I run that, and then I just go and take a look at X. Oh, sorry, not X. I have to do view X. Okay, so now here you see the carrier is MQ and AA, right? So that tells us something. Of course, we're not looking at all the rows. There are thousands of rows. There are uh, 52,000 rows. We are only seeing some initial ones. 
But I'm developing a hypothesis that maybe, uh, you know, many of them are MQ and AA, right? So that's what we see here. And then, okay, now let's try to find it out. Uh, so group by the carrier. So I'm trying to take all those flights and grouping them by carrier and count each of them. And then there you find that uh, AA and MQ account for most of these. Right? You find that uh, almost uh, 48,000 out of the 49,000 such occurrences are all AA and MQ. Now, if you do question mark planes, and if you look at the details, it tells you very clearly that American Airlines and MQ, which is NY Air, which is a subsidiary of uh, a code share partner of American Airlines, those two things actually don't report their tail numbers. They report something else. Okay, so that is why those tail numbers are actually not found in the planes table because for those particular airlines, what is reported in the planes table is not the tail number. It is something else. Okay, so that's what that's what you're seeing here. Okay, filter the flights to show only flights with planes that have flown at least 100 flights. Okay, so flights table, you want to filter it and show only those flights in which the planes that were used have flown at least 100 flights. Okay, so I'm creating a data frame, uh, a data frame called planes 100 more and I'm saying flights group by tail number count it and filter for n greater than or equal to 100, right? Because when you count it, you'll get a new column called n. So for every tail number, we'll get how many flights that tail number has flown, okay? And uh, we are saying out of those, give me only those for which the count is greater than or equal to 100. So now planes 100 or more, that particular data frame will have tail number and uh, the number of flights uh, that they have flown and all of them will be greater than 100. We don't really care about that because all we want is just the tail number of those planes, right? So the tail numbers in this would now be all of those that have flown 100 planes or more. So now we can do flights semi-join planes 100 more, okay? Okay, so here what we're saying is you might expect that there is an implicit relationship between plane and airline, right? Because in the plane table, uh, it tells you, uh, or alternately, you have the planes table and it tells you which airline the plane belongs to, right? So you may think that uh, in every flight, you've got a tail number and then you've got the airline flying the plane. So you may think that uh, a particular plane would be used only for flights by a particular airline. Right. In other words, there is an implicit relationship between plane and airline. So, for example, let's say you've got a particular plane with the tail number A, B, C, D, E, F. Right. And we would assume that if we looked at our data, that it's been used by only one particular airline. Okay. So, what we're saying is, let's confirm or reject this hypothesis. In other words, are there planes which were actually used by more than one airline? Well, that's perfectly possible. Right. So, for example, there might be a leased airplane. Right. Uh, uh, plane that uh, was leased, it will have a particular tail number, right? Let's say from January to March, it was leased by United Airlines. They returned it. They finished the lease and returned it. And then after that, let's say in April, it was leased by American Airlines. So you will find the same tail number actually having flown for multiple airlines, okay? So it could be lease or it could be that, you know, the plane got sold. A particular airline was using it and then it sold the plane to some other airline. So that is also a possibility. So that's what we want to find. Okay, let's just see if this is indeed the case. Let's find out what is the distinct number of planes used in flights. It turns out to be 4044. You can get it very easily. You can say length, unique, flights, dollar, tail number. Right, so if you did this, what you're saying is, go and get all the tail numbers in the flights table and just find out what are those, what are the unique values in that. Meaning if the same flight number occurs many times, it's not going to be counted. It will be counted as just one occurrence, one single occurrence. Okay, So this will tell us all the unique flight numbers that exist in that table. And then we are just saying, tell me the length of that. That turns out to be 4044. Right? So that means in the entire one year's data, 4044 different planes were used. Okay. So let's now look at the number of unique tail number carrier combinations. In other words, plane 
carrier combinations, right? The idea being, if every plane was used by only one airline, then the unique num tail number carrier combinations would also be only uh, 4044, right? You can find that by doing group by flights tail num carrier. That is, you're taking the flights data and grouping it by tail number and carrier, and uh, the result will tell you how many groups came out, which is how many distinct values that came out, and that turns out to be 4067. If you run it, it will tell you that there are 4067 distinct combinations of tail number and carrier. So that looks like kind of a mystery, right? So uh, there are only 4044 different planes, but there are 4067 different plane airline combinations, carrier combinations. So clearly, some planes were used by more than one airline. So now we can have a question, which specific planes were used by more than one airline? Okay, so what we could do is to group by tail number, right? So we have grouped uh, by individual uh, tail number. So that means for every specific aircraft, uh, we've got a group. And within the group, we can find out how many different carriers are there for each airline. So number of carriers, I'm saying length of unique carrier, right? So for example, suppose the tail number is A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, let's say it has flown uh, uh, 100 flights during the whole year. So we are saying out of those 100 flights, find out what are all the unique carriers, which unique airlines which have used them. If only one airline is used, then the length will be one. If it was actually used by two or more airlines, the length is going to be that appropriate number. Okay, so that's what we're getting. So we're taking flights, grouping it by tail number and adding a new field called number of carriers. Okay, then we can filter it and find out only those rows for which the number of carriers is greater than one. In other words, it will tell us now the specific tail numbers which were actually used by more than one airline. Okay, so if you did that, you will get the answer to this. In fact, it turns out that there are several such planes which were used by more than one airline. If you run it, you will actually see the results. Of course, you have the code. You can try it out. So what does this command do? Anti-join flights, comma, airports, by equals C desk equals FAA. So what we are saying here is, first of all, let's understand what this, what are the two tables and how they're being joined. So we're looking at the flights table, then we're looking at the airports table, and we are joining by the destination of the flights table equals FAA of the airports table. Okay, so, uh, so what we are saying is, we are looking for the destination of, F of the flights table to match the FAA of the airports table. Okay. But we are doing an anti-join. So if there is a match, we are going to discard it. Right? So what we will end up finding out is, only those flights for which the destination airport is actually not in the airports list at all. That's what we are going to do. Right? Because we are doing an anti-join, we are saying, find those flights for which the destination airport is somehow not listed in the airport table at all. Okay, so that's what this is doing. Uh, flights whose destination airport was not in the list of airports. How about the other way? Anti-join airports comma flights by FAA equals dust. Okay, now by the same argument, what this is doing is it's telling us which are all the airports which were not destinations in the flight table. Okay, so this is finding out airports which were not destinations. The earlier one was finding out flights whose destinations were not in the airport table. Right, the flights whose destinations simply didn't even exist in the airports table. Here we are finding airports, meaning that actually exist in the airports table, but no flights are going to those airports. Okay, so that's the difference. Airports for which none of the flights was the destination airport. So when you're doing an anti-join, obviously the, uh, the order matters a lot. Okay, so now, just like uh, you know, the, the operations we have been performing with tibbles, uh, sometimes just using set operations is very useful. Right? So here we are just creating two trial tibble tibbles to show you the example. So x, y, 1, 1, 2, 1. And then DF2 is one one two one uh, one two. Okay, so that's that's what uh, we've got here. Two tables. 
Now set operations, what they allow us to do is uh, they allow us to uh, just use set language to do the job, right? So this is DF1, this is DF2. Suppose we say intersect DF1, DF2, right? Intersect meaning tell me which rows are common to both of these data frames or tables, okay? So here, which rows are common? 1-1 one, one is there here, 1-1 one, one is here, 2-1 is here, 1-2 is here, right? So first of all, in order for you to perform these set operations, the two data frames must be identical in terms of structure, right? So this has columns X and Y, this has columns X and Y. This has two columns, this has two columns. So they have to be identical in that respect, only then set operations matter, okay, uh, or even feasible. So when you say intersect, you're saying, tell me the rows that are common to both of these data frames. So the result is obviously going to be uh, uh, one, one, right? That is just this, nothing else, one row. Union, on the other hand, says, give me a total listing of all the rows within the data frames, two data frames. That is, it's something like adding this to this. So it's obviously going to have one, one, uh, uh, two, one, and one, two. The order, of course, doesn't really matter. So that's what you get. So union is just a combination of rows in either in this data frame or in this data frame. But of course, it's not going to list any duplicates, right? Because these are set operations, so you won't get any duplicates. Okay, set difference is basically DF1, DF2 says, tell me the rows which are in DF1, which are not in DF2, right? Those which are in DF1, but not in DF2. That's what set difference does. So obviously, 1-1 one, one is there in both, so that doesn't figure out, figure in this, uh, in set diff. 2-1 is there in DF1, it's not there in DF2. So 2-1 will figure in the result. And of course, you can also do set diff DF2, DF1. That is, what is in DF2 but not in DF1? So once again, 1-1 one, one is in both, so it doesn't figure. 1-2 is here, but 1-2 is not here. So 1-2 is the result. Okay, so set difference operations are also sometimes useful. Uh, admittedly, rarely useful, but it's there. Just it's easy operations to keep in your bag. Uh, the reason they're not used too often is that uh, they work only when the structure of the uh, data frames involved is identical, and that rarely happens with us.